Hi everyone, happy 415 day and welcome to night school. I'm Lynn. Hi, I'm Christina, welcome. And we are part of the nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. For those of you that don't know, nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix some science with preachers, cocktails, music, and more. Night school is our at home virtual version where you can relax with some snacks uh, while Christina and I bring you some fun new themes every week. We are super excited for tonight's theme. Um, we brought some friends to talk about what it's like to visualize and illustrate science. Um, yeah, so let's just run through our amazing lineup. Um, also, there's a lot of, I think maybe new people, first timers here, we're seeing a lot of yeah. people from all over country. So welcome, we're really, ha we're really happy to have you. Um, so first up, um, Scientific American senior graphic editor, Jen Christensen, will demonstrate how illustration can help make wildly abstract topics in science like quantum physics and other things that can't be observed more tangible to more people. Um, we have Daniela Blakemar, professor of art history at USC, um, and she'll be showing off highlights from the amazing history of scientific illustration from the 1500s through the 1700s, um, including some really amazing work by non-Western indigenous and women artists and naturalists. Um, very important part of the history of scientific illustration. Um, and then next, uh, depictions of dinosaurs are everywhere. You probably grew up with a, um, an image of T-Rex that looks way different than the images of T-Rexes um, that today's kids are seeing. Um, so Zoe Lascaz, the author of Paleo Art, Visions of the Prehistoric Past, will delve into the early years of paleo art and the um, super creative ways that 19th century artists attempt to blend fact and their wild imaginations. And then finally, joining us from Japan, um, we have Misaki Uchida, an in-house science illustrator at one of Japan's leading stem cell research institutes. Um, and she'll talk about her role in the cutting edge of science and why uh, researchers working with this brand new um, research need scientific illustrators to help publish their work. So great lineup, stay for the whole thing. <laughs> yes, the whole thing. Um, as always, tonight's program is live. So continue saying hi in the chat. Um, let us know where you're watching from. Um, if it's your first time joining us or if you're night school regular, we always just like seeing who's who's a newbie and who's been with us for a while. We've been doing this for over a year. Um, we'll have Q&As with everyone after their talks, so make sure to add any questions in the chat. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to Jen. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And thanks to everyone out there for tuning in. Um, it's great to see where folks are coming from. Um, but I have another prompt for you as well. Uh, let's see, let me get the slides going. There we go. So when I say scientific illustration, what is the first thing that pops to your mind? You can type your answer in the chat box. I'll give a few seconds to see what kinds of answers start to pop up. So for me, it's classic botanical illustrations, like this one by Maria Sibylla Marion. I posed the question on Twitter and received 74 replies. Most folks, most folks um, referenced to subject matter. 17 either stated anatomical illustration or referenced a particular piece of artwork that portrayed anatomy. Botanical illustration was number two, followed by cell diagrams, a variety of animals, astronomy, dinosaur reconstructions, and evolution as a subject matter. Eight people referenced a specific or general publication outlet like textbooks and magazines. 19 people referenced a specific artist, most often Leonardo da Vinci. 13 shared or referenced a specific piece of art. 26 people alluded to a past era and 14 folks nodded to the idea of purpose, such as art that is intended to explain a concept or provide a glimpse of something in the form of a cutaway or x-ray view. 
So if that informal and totally unscientific Twitter poll is at all accurate, this type of work, specifically anatomical illustrations by Leonardo da Vinci, is what a lot of people think of when prompted with the phrase scientific illustration, which is more or less in line with what popped to my mind. So maybe I'm oversimplifying a little here, but in general, vintage illustrations that portray an object or a group of objects. But this is the genre that excites me the most when it comes to actually working and collaborating on scientific illustrations, explanatory diagrams. And I was really excited to see that the idea of explaining concepts and processes was the first thing that popped to mind for about 13% of the people that responded to my informal Twitter poll and hopefully some of you as well. So for the next 10 to 15 minutes, let's take a lo closer look at drawing unseeable science. What does a process or a concept even look like? And how do rep artists represent things that can't be directly observed? The examples that follow are from the pages of Scientific American Magazine. So I've been a graphics editor at the magazine for the last 14 years, and I was an assistant art director um, there for a few years in the late 90s. So some of these illustrations are projects that I may have been involved in as a project manager of sorts. And a couple of them I illustrated myself, but the majority are drawn by other artists. Let's start with a prion. It's a subatomic particle, so it's smaller than an atom, that by the scientist's own admission may or may not even exist. And if it does exist, we certainly know nothing of its form, its texture, or its color. Yet I asked an artist to include all of those qualities when drawing it for the magazine. In theory, this sort of representation would have been more appropriate. The bottom diagram is spare, it's clean and to the point. The top diagram includes dimension, shadows, gradients, arbitrary colors, and textures. I like the idea of the bottom illustration since it avoids adding unknown or unnecessary details, but I find the top one more inviting. That's not to say that one is a better solution than the other. I mean, everything's contextual, right? Um, everything hinges on who your audience is, or who you want your audience to be. Scientific illustration in academic journals serve one purpose, and that purpose is generally different from scientific illustration in a newspaper or a magazine, which is different from illustrations in a science museum setting. Even these two examples created for the same magazine were created for different audiences at different moments in time using different technologies. When it comes to scientific illustrations for a magazine, I often speak of the goal of making science more accessible to more people. Images are often great at doing that, but I'd be remiss if I didn't nod to the limitations of illustration, particularly in the context of the word accessibility. A digital screen reader, for example, it can't read an illustration out loud for folks with vision impairments. So words are pretty critical too, and they may work better for some people. But the visual metaphors that we use in illustration may help inform those words in a useful way and vice versa. So let's get back to some more examples. Some things by their very definition are more or less unseeable. Dark matter, for example. Now, how do you illustrate something that doesn't have a visible form? In some cases, um, like this for an article on ancient galaxy clusters by Ariana Long, we can be often like default to indicating the presence of dark matter by the absence of color. Here's a closer look. The richest black represents dark matter, partly defined by the halo of light around it. So I think that people are pretty savvy when it comes to interpreting visible depictions of invisible attributes. Here, for example, in this illustration by Emily Cooper, Air currents, moisture flow, and temperature are indicated with arrows and bold colors. But I suspect that you probably aren't reading this literally. There aren't huge semi-transparent and boldly colored arrows floating above the ocean. But rather, those objects and colors represent forces and things that are invisible. Sometimes the object being illustrated is more or less observable and theoretically could be drawn, 
more or less as it exists. Like this, for example. It's a drawing of part of the cardiovascular system. Although it's pretty stylized, it functions to show the position of things. But what if instead of showing the shape of it, you wanted to get across the idea that the cardiovascular system is a closed loop in which blood continuously circulates? That idea is shown more clearly here, and even more so here. These three examples were all drawn by artist Bungie Tagawa for different articles over about a five-year period. Each article focused on a slightly different aspect of the circulatory system. The different levels of abstraction made sense in their respective articles. Often when it comes to drawing unseeable science, the boundary between drawing things and drawing processes or concepts or ideas is quite blurred but there's still an object at the heart of it, as in this example. Other times the concept or idea takes the lead and the objects are manufactured. Here, in a data visualization by Nadi Bremer, a discrete cube of the universe is depicted, creating a finite object out of something that is essentially infinite. The cube defines the edges of the model scientists use to explore the idea of interstellar exploration and patterns of habitation over a 10 million year timeline. Each dot marks the current position of a settled or settleable planetary system. Each color represents one of 11 distinct interstellar empires. Nadi uses dot position, color, connection lines and spheres of influence to ascribe meaning to variables in a mathematical model. She, like a Jonathan Quarrell Nenlin back, one of the researchers who was involved directly in the project, illustrated something that doesn't really exist. I like to think of it as a robust kind of mathematical thought experiment illustrated. Now this illustration aims to make the concept of quantum entanglement a bit less abstract with the help of a visual metaphor. The caption refers to the quantum entanglement of two particles, ions. Ions are atoms or molecules with an electric charge, but they aren't cubes. But by drawing cubes and playing with optical illusions, we can help folks understand the idea of superposition, the object being in two different states at the same time, and then how two different objects can get entangled and forced into the same state in tandem. Visual metaphors are really handy when it comes to making abstract topics more relatable. When a concept steps into a realm that seems to play by different rules of logic than our day-to-day -day observed experiences, including something very familiar in the illustration can really welcome a reader in. Here, artist Jillian Dittner introduces two ideas entanglement and wormholes. Then she combines the two concepts in a way that feels familiar and relatable. This graphic is an elegant and clean representation of cosmic expansion from a 1976 issue of Scientific American. I love its matter of fact and stark style. It feels kind of confident and authoritative, smart but I need to read the text to give me a clear sense of the subject matter. Without the caption, title, or full article text, I have no clue that this is an information graphic about the universe. And it certainly doesn't tell a clearly evident story. This example from 2004 addresses the same topic, but makes a bit of a trade-off. References to quantitative values are dropped, but context is added. The casual reader now has a better sense of place. This is an article about the cosmos and a clearer view of the implications of expansion over time. Galaxies are represented as tiny clusters of stars. All three dimensions of space are represented and there are three views provided, so three snapshots in time. In some ways, again, I prefer the 76 graphic. There's something kind of intellectually appealing about it as an icon for cosmic expansion. But the dimensional 2004 version engages me. I can picture myself on a planet, so on one of those tiny galaxies in an expanding universe. 
When it comes to showing processes, an artist can use false color and simplified or exaggerated shapes to help drive home the main points. Here, for example, spike proteins on a virus and the receptors on a human cell that they dock onto are drawn as clearly related shapes, like a lock and key. This is a relationship that, in reality, isn't something that's really clearly visible. The shapes here represent the concept faithfully, though. I think one of the greatest challenges scientific illustrators face is trying to make a true connection with a reader. And that's a pretty nebulous thing to try. Sometimes it's interesting to really lean into the idea of narrative storytelling to try to make that happen. For an article on how climate change writ large has resulted in more local extreme weather events, author Jennifer Francis provided a, a really super set of references in the forms of maps and charts like this one for the graphics. But simply presenting one map and chart after another felt like it would do a disservice to the very personal and urgent tone of the article. Artist Matthew Twombly was a great match for the project. He threaded those jet stream and ocean temperature maps into a visual story featuring the author of the article as the narrator of the graphic itself. Jennifer Francis not only wrote the story, but she's also a scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts. She experienced the extreme weather event described in this graphic firsthand. So Matthew was able to authentically represent that here and inject some humanity into the imagery. After all, that's the end goal, right? Make a connection between the person reading the illustration and the content it portrays. Share a bit of scientific knowledge, a thing, an experience, a finding, or an idea. Ideally using a visual language that makes sense to your audience. Often that means trying to figure out how to connect dots, fill in the blanks, and make the invisible visible. Just one more thing. Since I started out this talk evoking vintage botanical illustrations, I think it's important to end with an acknowledgement that colonization has gone hand in hand with a lot of that vintage work in particular. Um, I still have so much to learn on this front, and I'm not in a position to speak on it with any authority. Um, but I found this article by Jean Cazior really interesting, and it includes links to the work of contemporary artist Maria Teresa Alves and the New York Botanical Gardens Black Botany Exhibit, among others. Um, and I'm also really excited to hear from art historian Daniela Blechmar this evening, um, as well as the other presenters to follow. So thanks for having me, and I look forward to uh, any questions. Hi, Jen. Hey. Thanks for that presentation. It was just a visual feast, so I'm excited for tonight. Um, <laughs> but for those of you looking to read more about what Jen, about the link, um, well, Christina's adding the link right now um, for the article and website that Jen was just talking about at the end. Um, so if you're looking for it, it's in the chat. Um, but Jen, we have a few questions. Um, first one is how much of scientific illustration today is done digitally versus by hand? Oh gosh, um, quite a bit. Although I think the pendulum is swinging back more towards by hand as well. Well, when I say quite mm -hmm. a bit, I mean for magazines and newspapers. Um, uh, gives, you know, uh, traditional um, is often done, you know, murals and things like that are obviously, right. um, you know, done on a wall. Um, but I think that there's a merging of them now um, more than ever in that a lot of artists are starting with pencil or maybe using watercolor and then digitizing it and kind of working back and forth that way. Interesting. Do you have a sense of like what, what kind of factors come into play as far as why you would do it digitally versus why by hand? Yeah, I think um, like doing something digitally in three dimensions is pretty amazing if you think or know you might need to turn the perspective a little bit. Because if you've done it by hand and somebody says, hey, can, I'd love, that looks great, but I'd love to see it from about 15 degrees higher. Or can we see what the other side looks like? And it's a whole different ballgame. Um, yeah. But if you built it in 3D, um, that can really be a huge, uh, a huge time saver. Yeah. That is a fair point. Mm -hmm. um, as an editor, what do you feel makes a good science illustrator? Should they be a scientist first or have the talent for illustration or drawing first? Oh, I 
I work with artists who kind of fill probably every single one of those <laughs> those descriptions. Um, I, I don't think that there's a there's a one kind of path to it that, that works for everyone. Some folks are um, much more kind of self uh, self educated in terms of things like paleontology, and then um, and that can be just as great as as having been a, a you know having studied science in school. Um, I think just a real sense of curiosity and interest and ability to like really dive into that information um, yeah. is, is the critical piece, yeah. Yeah, we have some aspiring illustrators in the comments uh, and we have some questions on what steps do artists take to start working with science and researchers? Do your artists work along with the article authors? Um, so at Scientific American, um, uh, we often, you know, we are a lot of our authors are scientists. Um, so some of them are journalists, but uh, some of them are scientists, and some of them are, you know, a little bit of a combination. Um, so I often work directly with the artists and act as liaison between them mm -hmm. and the scientists, um, just to help kind of streamline things as well and keep things moving along. Um, but in many cases, I think, you know, scientists and labs are working directly with artists as well. So um, if you're seeing the work come out of a particular science research lab, um, you know, reach out to the scientists and see if they, uh, they need some work done. Um, I mean, I started out doing a hydrothermal vent shrimp mouth part illustrations at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, get, kind of getting hooked up with or connected with a research lab or a curator um, can often kind of start to, to kind of create that path. That sounds very specific. <laughs> yeah. um, the, here's another interesting question. Um, how far can you push abstraction until it's not accurate anymore? And how do you decide? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So I guess the the key is is what needs to be accurate: the concept or the idea or the the thing that you're drawing. Um, I tend to be a stickler for some things, like you know, DNA helix uh, is right hand turning. So there's a particular way direction it's supposed to turn. Um, I really get hung up if I see a piece of art in which it's turning the wrong way. But then I need to remind myself, does it really matter to the layperson? They see that symbol, they think DNA. But to a scientist, they would really notice yeah. it. It would almost be like drawing, uh, you know, the thumb on the wrong side of the hand in a figure. Um, or it would really pop out to some people and other people um, might be maybe not so much. Um, so I guess it really, it kind of really boils down to the goal of what you're trying to do. Great. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I guess there's questions, there's, as I mentioned, there are aspiring illustrators. So there's question, another question is, what do I need to do to explore scientific illustration as a career? Or do you have just, do you have any general advice for pursuing scientific illustration as a career? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's some programs out there. Um, uh, I, I went to a, the grad program at UC Santa Cruz. Now that program's at, um, Mo in Monterey Bay, so Cal State. Um, University of Monterey Bay. Um, there are also some other scientific illustration programs around the country and um, and around the world. Um, medical illustration programs, there's a lot of those too, if you wanna take it in a medical direction. Um, there's the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, um, the Association of Medical Illustrators, so AMI and GNSI. Those are two really great resources to start with as well. Great, thank you so much, Jen, for all of that information. Mm -hmm. um, up next, we'll have Zoe Lascaz. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Lynn and Christina, and to the Academy for having me, and to Jen for that great first talk. Um, that was really fascinating. Uh, my name is Zoe, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of paleo art, which, as you all probably know, is the practice of reconstructing prehistoric animals and their world based on fossil evidence. Um, so not talking about paleolithic cave paintings made by prehistoric people, but actually images of prehistory made over the course of the past two centuries. So one of the reasons I find paleo art so fascinating is that it's everywhere, but it's also kind of invisible. You know, most of us grew up knowing what dinosaurs and pterodactyls and saber-toothed tigers look like since we were kids, 
But we don't often pause and stop and think how or why we have this mental image of a world that no one has ever seen. So paleo art as a genre kind of remains more obscure than other forms of natural history illustration. You know, I think most people probably know the name John James Audubon uh, more so than Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins or Charles Knight or Stenyak Burian even uh, though these paleo artists are the reason why we have that mental picture of the prehistoric world. So that's partly why I wrote my book, uh, which was published by Tashin in 2017. And in it, I didn't approach these works as a paleontologist or someone uh, chiefly concerned with the scientific accuracy of these images, uh, but rather as an art historian curious about what else they might teach us because while these images were based on the science of the day, there were other significant factors that shaped them, uh, whether that's the individual artist biography or that person's training and stylistic influences or the broader cultural context in which the work was created. And as we'll see, a given dinosaur might look very different depending on whether it's painted in Victorian England or in the United States during the Gilded Age or in World War II era Prague. So this is the image that effectively launched the whole tradition. It's called Duria Antiquior. Uh, it was painted by an English geologist and clergyman named Henry de la Beach in about 1830. And it's small, it's uh, just over a foot wide, and it shows what is now the southern coast of England during the Jurassic period. And there had been a few earlier renderings of prehistoric animals prior to this work, but this is the first one that really has a full landscape and interactions going on between all the different creatures. And as you can see, those interactions are pretty violent. Uh, we have more than 30 animals here, and most of them are feeding or fighting or fleeing or bleeding, or in the case of this one plesiosaur, uh, defecating as it dies. So I think this has really had a tremendous impact because when most of us picture the prehistoric world, we tend to imagine these violent confrontations, you know, triceratops squaring off against T-Rex, volcanoes going off in the background. But these are really artistic elaborations that begin with this image and uh, that have more to do with us and our appetite for narrative drama than they really do with animal behavior. So from the beginning, Paleoart has always kind of straddled the line between science and entertainment. And the guy who painted this, he was a scientist himself, and he was among the first people to study these species and to formally describe them. But he's also clearly having fun imagining this gory reptilian free-for-all. So Paleoart gradually went from this image to uh, uh, appear in various books, some more scholarly than others over the course of the 19th century. Uh, this image on the upper left is by Edouard Rieu, uh, a French illustrator from 1863. And he's clearly borrowing this, uh, this confrontation between the ichthyosaur and the plesiosaur from De La Beach. And you see it really became one of these uh, super popular motifs throughout the century. And when we consider the popularity of this particular confrontation, I think we have to look at the political context in which these images were being made. These particular animals were being discovered in the immediate aftermath of the Napoleonic War, during which pretty much every European country with a coastline got involved. And likewise, uh, the United States and Britain were engaged in the War of 1812. And so there were all these battles on the high seas that I think made this particular showdown uh, really appealing to audiences and also contributes to the fact that these animals aren't really engaging with one another like animals would. You know, if these confrontations did occur, they probably would have done so underwater. But instead, these reptiles are rearing up above the surf and uh, going at it more like warships than like aquatic reptiles. So beyond those circumstances, I don't think it's impossible to underestimate uh, the effects of the cultural and scientific changes going on during the 19th century. You know, this was an era of rapid and dramatic transformation and technological acceleration uh, that really toppled entire values and uh, entire ways of life. And this was partly due to the Industrial Revolution dramatically, permanently altering society. And it was also a period of explosive scientific discovery, uh, which changed the way people understood themselves and the world around them. And you might think geology was a kind of tame science, 
uh, which at the time included the study of fossils. Um, but in fact, it was really uniquely threatening because this is when people are uh, reckoning with the fact that the planet is in fact much older than had been previously believed and, uh, as ex and with extinction as a concept. And that's big because, you know, today we're so accustomed to grim reports about vanishing species and the climate crisis that it's really hard to put ourselves in the place of the artists and scientists who are first grappling with the concept of extinction. Because to be clear, people had been finding fossils for millennia, but they'd had traditionally been ascribed to dragons or giants or thought to be the remains of mythological creatures. It was only uh, at the turn of the 19th century that you get the first airtight, widely accepted argument for extinction. And uh, it was disconcerting because if these animals, these big, powerful, ferocious animals could go extinct, then maybe humans could too. And our tenure on this planet wasn't as much of a guarantee as we thought. So I think some of that anxiety is what's manifesting uh, in this paleo art with all the violence and gothic horror. And you know there was room for that uh, nightmarish drama and other fantastical elements and imaginative elaborations because no one had ever seen these animals before. And um, I can't even imagine what it would be like to have to uh, draw a scientifically accurate image of an animal that no one has ever seen. Um, Jen sort of addressed this in her comments on trying to draw dark matter. But um, often paleo artists, they were working with so little evidence uh, and just really incomplete skeletons. So they had to use their imagination to fill in the blanks. So these three images all show the same species. This is Iguanodon. Um, but as you can see, there are these anatomical variations and the whole mood and vibe of, of each work is pretty distinct. Um, and during these early years of paleo art, when there was much uh, less scientific uh, evidence, much less fossil evidence available, artists were really drawing on uh, art historical traditions to fill in the blanks. And so they were looking at, you know, how to make a monster basically. And the approach that artists from Hieronymus Bosch to Bruegel to cultures all over the world uh, we're using, you basically take parts of existing species uh, to make a chimera or a monster or a demon. So you can see in, in the plesiosaur on the left, uh, the artist has given it this uh, forked tongue like a serpent. And then on the right, it has these um, clawed appendages, kind of normal tongue. Of course, there's volcanoes going off constantly. <laughs> um, but not all works of paleo art were these violent hellscapes. You know, this is an image by an Austrian artist named Josef Kuvisag, and he was a landscape painter, and he was collaborating with a paleo botanist on this project. So you can see the little animal in the center is really not the focus. He was much more concerned with the plants and ecology and the landscape. And I think he's a great example of how individual artists brought their own skill sets, their own talents, their own idiosyncratic interests to bear on prehistory and, and make it their own. But if some of the images we've looked at so far have uh, something in common, uh, it's that they were two dimensional and generally pretty inaccessible to the lay person. They were appearing in lavishly illustrated books that were prohibitively expensive. So although uh, prehistory and particularly dinosaurs are a big blockbuster phenomenon today, that wasn't the case during the first half of the 19th century. Uh, the average person didn't really know what a dinosaur was or what it looked like, didn't really care. But that changed in 1854 when you get the first life-size sculptures of prehistoric reptiles. And these were by an artist named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins who uh, created them for the Crystal Palace Exposition when it was rebuilt in Sydenham outside of London. And he was a master showman who courted publicity throughout the process. So this is a view of his studio on the Crystal Palace grounds. And I love the little rats at the bottom and the bird kind of showing that it was open to the elements. Um, but the newspapers went nuts every time the queen and her consort came to visit him there. He even threw a dinner party inside the Iguanodon mold. So you can see an invitation to that on the left and a image of the feast itself on the right. And uh, it was a huge smashing success when it opened. 40,000 people attended uh, the Crystal Palace on opening day and 2 million people came through every year through the end of the century. So this is really when prehistory goes mainstream and people come to know it. And it was partly because even people who didn't get to see the exhibition might encounter uh, these 
prehistoric models um, in other forms because Hawkins's images proliferated in all sorts of formats. Uh, here's an illustration from a German popular science book. Here are some uh, Swiss chocolate cards that are clearly based on Hawkins's designs. So he went on to do some other great things for paleontology and for, woo, sorry about that, um, paleontology and paleo art. He assembled the first dinosaur uh, sculpture, uh, skeleton rather, in space in 1869. He painted the first suite of oil paintings devoted to prehistory in 1876 at what is now Princeton University. Uh, this image belongs to that series. But for all of these achievements, he encountered setback after setback, and there were uh, all these commissions that fell through uh, because there was really serious uh, resistance to paleo art at the time. It was controversial. Some uh, really prestigious scientists felt that it was too speculative to be useful and that it had the sort of dangerous ability to uh, embed inaccurate images in the minds of the public that were very difficult to correct. So Hawkins died a kind of anonymous death, and it was an American artist who would build on his innovations and uh, have the support uh, primarily from the American Museum of Natural History in New York to get paleo art institutionalized and, uh, and really run with it. And you can see there's this night and day difference in Knight's image, uh, images compared to what we've seen before. These animals are lifelike and dynamic, incredible, in a way that previous images weren't. You know, here are some details from that Hawkins painting, and they're sort of stylized and cartoony. Um, I love this guy on the upper right, uh, sort of like a bad Shakespearean actor overdoing his death scene. Um, but Knight, he had a trick. He uh, was already really well versed in animal anatomy. He grew up sketching at the Bronx Zoo and the American Museum of Natural History. And he uh, he brought this, this knowledge to bear on his art, but he also sculpted his specimens or his subjects in clay. He would consult with paleontologists to better understand how these animals might have looked and how they may have carried themselves and moved. And then he would sculpt them and he would place the models outside so he could really observe how the sun would rake over the frill of a ceratopsid skeleton, a uh, ceratopsid dinosaur, or rake over the sail of an animal like this Dimetrodon. So here's the painting that resulted from that and a version of the sculpture cast in bronze. And uh, he also paid attention to setting and location. You know, some of his dinosaurs appear in uh, sort of dusty, arid regions, others in uh, grassy valleys or forested areas. And in the case of the Sprontosaurus, it's, it's in a pretty credible swamp. So Knight's magnum opus really was this commission for the Field Museum in Chicago. This painting is more than 25 feet wide. It's nine feet tall. And he, he got the commission in 1928 and created this astounding series that really uh, has resonated through paleo art and through film ever since. Um, this was the basis for the confrontations uh, between Kong and dinosaurs in, uh, in King Kong in 1933 and, of course, Fantasia in 1940. And it really led to the institutionalization of paleo art. There was a spike in museum commissions. It was sort of normalized in the way we now accept it, as well as a big boom in uh, popular science books devoted to prehistory and spectacles like the dinosaurs at the 1933 World's Fair. So his images made their way around the world, um, including to the Czech Republic, where uh, Zdeněk Burian saw them. Zdeněk Burian was an artist who uh, took some of Knight's templates and gave them his own dark slant. He uh, had this really tumultuous, violent childhood. He lived through two world wars, through the brief promise of the Prague Spring and then the brutal Soviet invasion afterward. And uh, he worked with the chilling awareness that humanity might bring about its own extinction and uh, we might be the architects of our own mortality as a species. And so I think there's a certain poignancy to uh, painting, you know, big ferocious animals in the context of, of the Cold War, uh, animals that no longer are around. And I'll wrap up by noting that it's this quality of paleo art, the uh, window it offers into our cultural ideals and anxieties, into our fraught relationship with power and obsolescence and our own mortality uh, that makes it so compelling and that makes it worth preserving because paleo art is vulnerable in ways that other forms of scientific illustration are not. Uh, one of the great pleasures of researching this book was tracking down obscure pieces all over the place, but 
the process also made me realize how, how much has been lost because um, older works are regularly discarded when scientific discoveries render them out of date. So I hope this presentation helps communicate uh, why I think paleo art is worth hanging on to, uh, even when it's out of date. And uh, I think it has a lot to teach us, not only about the history of science, but about ourselves. So thank you so much. Um, I'd love to answer any questions. Awesome presentation, Zoe. Thank you so much. Um, I wish you could just go through again and just like riff off, <laughs> riff on like every, um, illustration because there's a lot going on yeah um, in them. probably tried to cover too much ground but uh thanks oh, for no, no no um it's great so yeah we have some questions great um in between wonderful wonderful thank you um so um so why um, so why do you think that earlier paleo artists all depicted the dinosaurs as monstrous with forked tongues? Like, it seems like they just went straight there to like, these are big, so they must be terrifying. No, that's, that's a great question. And, and one I sort of tried to address in uh, that rush description of yeah. uh, the cultural societal upheaval during the 19th century. You know, I think people really were contending with an entire way of life disappearing. And uh, so themes of, of loss uh, were really acutely felt and to have these um, types of animals that had vanished from the face of the earth was was kind of, you know, uh, scary for people. And I think we mm -hmm. they were just the ideal vessels for anxiety and you could kind of project a lot onto them. And during the 19th century, there also was this renewed fascination uh, with medieval uh, lore. You know, you have mm -hmm. poems like the Fairy Queen. People hadn't really cared that much about dragons after the medieval period, but it's during the 19th century that there's this resurgence of interest um, in those, you know, uh, sorts of sorts of forms, but uh, we see you know gothic novels, penny dreadfuls. There's a general appetite for monstrosity um, and that discomfort with scientific change. You see that in in Frankenstein is the most obvious example, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think all of that contributes to it. And and I did sort of focus more on those because they're more fun, but there are works of paleo art where they're not all horns and flared tongues and stuff, I promise. <laughs> but, um, and then here's an interesting question. Like, um, so do you think that, um, I guess this, this same anxiety about the um, very real possibility of human extinction is still being reflected in art uh, like paleo art or other types of um, natural world art today? Um, no, that's another great question. Uh, I do think so. I don't profess to be an expert on contemporary paleo art. I mean, I think the genre has gotten fascinating and broader in some ways. You know, the work we were looking at was pretty much all made by, you know, white guys, and that's mm -hmm. that's changed uh over the past um, couple decades, really, and, uh, and artists from other places are contributing. So the genres become more diverse and more interesting, but I don't know as much about it. I do think um, that you can see certain examples though, like there was an artist named Ellie Kish, who was Canadian and she was making paleo art in the seventies and eighties, but really right around the time that climate science first emerged on uh, global warming. And she created mm -hmm. these apocalyptic scenes of just emaciated dinosaurs, like straggling right. across the desert. A lot of extinction imagery with an eye for the landscape and for cooling and warming events. And so that's a sort of literal example. But sure, I think that paleo art is always kind of a way of contending with, with those issues. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, Oh, so, so this is interesting because a lot of the um, the art you're talking about, you know, is in the like mid to late uh, 19th century. So uh, along with the general like cultural anxiety, um, how do you think, or do you think the publication of the origin of species affected paleo art scientific illustration at the time? Absolutely. I mean, you didn't even get to go into this, but <laughs> you look at Benjamin Warhouse's Hawkins's sculptures, people often remark on the fact that they're sort of mammalian. You know, you don't have these split mm. lizard legs. They're sort of going mm -hmm. straight down and they kind of look like reptilian rhinoceri. And that was a reflection of his collaboration with Sir Richard Owen, who is 
mostly remembered now as uh, being the bozo who disagreed with extinction, uh, which is regrettable because he was a really brilliant anatomist, but he did get that one wrong. And he uh, was uh, Darwin's opponent. And so when he became the scientific advisor on the Crystal Palace Commission, he was like, okay, here's an opportunity to make my counter vision um, you know, very public because, you know, to counter evolutionary reasoning, you have to argue against the idea that animals become more advanced over time. Yeah. So he had a vested interest in portraying prehistoric animals as already pretty advanced and then having degenerated into like flimsy little modern reptiles. So that was his sort of modus operandi. And, um, and you know, Hawkins was, was party to that. And uh, yeah. that's why those look the way they did. So that's kind of the biggest example I can think of. Wow, super interesting. Um, I saw something about, how did somebody ask? I, don't know, I can't find it now. Um, but anyway, um, you, you mentioned this briefly um, in your answer to another question, but did you, in your research, did you ever get to look at um, paleo illustrations from non-Western artists and, and um, how did they differ? Unfortunately, no, because I was really focused on uh, paleo art the first 150 okay. years or so of its history. And, um, you know, it's only quite recent, uh, uh, quite a recent phenomenon that, um, you know, people in some of the most fossil rich areas in the world, whether that's China or Mongolia or South America, have um, been training, you know, their own generation of paleontologists mm -hmm. uh, who have the the training and the resources to pursue excavations on their own. You know, unfortunately, the historical model has always been, um, you know, Europeans swooping in, taking the fossils, jetting back to Europe. And as a result, um, the people drawing up their finds tend to be Europeans as a result. So, um, like I said, that's that's really changed so dramatically. And, you know, any sequel to Paleo Art uh, would be more interesting for that reason. Um, it's definitely a homogenous crew of artists. Um, so somebody asked, this has somebody ask, where do you find your book if people are interested in reading it? Hmm. Or, or uh, it? Well, I think, uh, you could probably find it on, uh, used book sites like a books, okay. um, or, uh, Biblio. Um, I'm going to recommend those before I mention the obvious Amazon. Yeah, okay. Answer, uh, I I don't think, I think the edition sold out, so I don't think okay. uh, it's actually available through Tashin's site anymore. So your best bet is a used bookstore. And I wish I had more copies because I could send them to you, but um, I thought it would be a good <laughs> idea to get the Spanish and the French and, and German ones. And now I, I have <laughs> versions of my book I can't read or give to friends, so. Um, <laughs> um, well, maybe people can, you know, write in, like get another edition printed, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, don't I wouldn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Storm the castle, pitchforks. Yeah. <laughs> right, passion. Um, and then finally, like, is there a specific kind of like style of paleo art that you, or like an artist that you really, really felt yourself like drawn to that you just like might have on your wall behind you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I love Burian's work just because um, you know his his stuff is kind of gritty and violent. I didn't get to show a ton of images by him, but unlike uh, sort of previous images of Neanderthals, for instance, um, he really gets into what it would have been like to be living in a cave, not showering. Like you can almost feel their greasy skin and matted hair and smell them, and he paints mm -hmm. them cannibalizing you know, their own kind. And so uh, it's really, it's really dark and morbid. And I like that. And then, um, you know, I'm proudest of the research I was able to do in Russia um, on Soviet uh, paleo art, just because that hadn't been previously published on, on really either side of the Iron Curtain. And some of those artists are just bonkers, uh, bonkers <laughs> like Konstantin Konstantinovich Florov. Um, in, you know, he was a scientist, but this was clearly his outlet for his creative expression, yeah. which 
you know, artists in the Soviet Union, like you kind of had to paint the cheerful Soviet farmers and, uh, you know, happy literate peasants, you know, you, um, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a super expressive moment. Um, so he kind of used scientific illustration, I argue, um, as a means of making more evocative uh, experimental work than he would have been able to as a fine artist. So his works are just like all orange and blue and purple and mauve and they're really, uh, they're really exuberant and uh, unlike anything else. So he might be my favorite. Nice. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was amazing. It must have been so much fun to research this book. Um, and also somebody mentioned in the comments, thank you. You can also check your local library. To see ah, if yes, them. that is the obvious so, way to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Up next, Great. we have Daniela Blakemar. Thank you so much, Zoe. Bye. You're good to go. You're muted still, though. <laughs> now there you can you go. hear me. Now you can see me and you can hear me. Wow, what Beautiful. a way to start. I'll leave you Hello, to night it. coolers. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I'm Daniela Blechmar. I'm a professor of art history and history. And um, we are traveling back in time. We started with contemporary scientific illustration. We moved to the 19th century. And I'm going to take you back to a time before computers, before video, before photography, and before this idea that science and art were two separate things. I am uh, sharing with you the covers of two books that I have written about the history of scientific illustration. And both of them focus on places and peoples who have often been written out of the history of science and the history of art. And I will circle back to that at the end of my um, presentation today. I'm going to start uh, not quite in uh, the uh, uh, prehistoric time, but in uh, 1540s, uh, at a time when uh, there was uh, new ways to do science. And I'm showing you the kinds of materials that I work with, special books, rare books from the 16th century. Uh, they are in the scientific language of the 16th century, which was Latin. And I am showing you one botanical book and one anatomical book. And both of these books were revolutionary in suggesting that images and that looking were central to the work of scientific uh, education, scientific practice, and uh, scientific communication. So uh, let's start with botany. This is, um, you see on the right of your screen, uh, Leonhard Fuchs, the author of this book, uh, published in 1542, a brick of a book. And what Fuchs tried to do was to create a list of every single plant known in Europe. And not just to describe them in words, here you see an opening, but also to have images representing um, each plant and images that were made from life, not copied from previous books, but made from drawing land, uh, um, live plants. He was interested in showing both plants that were very familiar and also plants that were new and exciting, uh, such as uh, pepper, which was newly arrived in Europe from the Americas. Uh, so very exotic plants to botanists and uh, to Europeans at this time. And uh, the images were so important to the book that Fuchs included not only a woodcut of himself, but also of the three artists who were specially commissioned to produce the hundreds of woodcuts that illustrate this book. So these are the first published uh, scientific illustrators. And uh, you see a bit of the process and of the labor that it took. So on the uh, right, the top right of the images, you see an artist who drew uh, from the life the plants. 
on the left next to him, you see that drawing being copied onto a wooden block and the very serious man at the bottom labeled sculptor uh, would uh, carve the woodblock so that these images could be printed. So it was pretty unusual to have a book with these many images. It was pretty unusual uh, to include the portraits of the uh, artist, but lest we think that Fuchs uh, thought that the scientists and the artists had the same authority, he was very, very clear in his text that he had to work very hard to make sure that the artist worked in the style that he thought was the best for science, not for art. And in this, the images for him were somewhere in between a, um, diagram and a portrait of an actual plant. He thought you wanted something that could apply to any version of that plant. So naturalistic, uh, but not the actual portrait. I am showing you uh, hand color uh, images because of course at this time, uh, printing was in black and white. And so the book would have been sold in black and white. And then if you were a wealthy uh, customer, you could pay someone, an illuminator, uh, to actually color it by hand, um, which brings in interesting problems if each illuminator is coloring their own copy for the customer, because you end up with different illuminators using different colors. And it doesn't matter very much if Fuchs' coat is blue or black, but when you're painting uh, the colors of plants and you're reading a text that describes a plant as blue and the illuminator um, colored it red, it does create this tension between the image and the text. So they were working in coordination, but not always uh, seamlessly. At almost the same time, uh, look at the date. Uh, this book was printed in Basel in 1542. Uh, the next year, we have what is the most famous anatomical book of the uh, 16th century, a really revolutionary book, a book entitled On the Fabric of the Human Body. And it's a bit hard to see this image, so I um, blew it up for you. And what you see at the center of the image was something that was extremely revolutionary at the time, which was to perform an autopsy and to teach medicine um, by witnessing the dissection of a human cadaver. This uh, was a totally new way of teaching medicine. The traditional way had been uh, by reading the books of ancient authorities and not uh, uh, conducting dissections of humans. And you see that the person who is conducting um, the, uh, the dissection, he's looking straight at us in a, a almost a three quarter profile. He has his little beard, he's very uh, sure of himself, is the young author who was revolutionizing medicine with his new technique. And I wanted to mention that the word autopsy uh, comes from the Latin autopsia, which comes from the Greek, and it literally means to see by yourself, to be an eyewitness. So this concept of autopsia, of seeing with your own eyes, was central to science at the time. And that is what made images really, really important. It gave them a new importance that they didn't used to have before when eyewitnessing was not that important. So the book that Vesalius authored um, transmits these uh, uh, visions of something that is invisible for most people, which is the inside of the human body. There is this running thread through the presentations about scientific illustrations often showing not something that you can see, but something that is almost always invisible. And as you can see, Vesalius took a very different strategy from Fuchs. He did not think that scientific illustrations should be artless, should be dry, uh, that the artist needed to be reined in. He thought, go for it. And so you have these very, very dramatic poses. Um, there's a series of plates that are rotating the skeleton and you see the skeletons uh, posed almost in sculptural uh, ways. 
there's this very uh, famous series uh, of uh, the um, musculature of the human body. They're known as a muscle man. And as you can see, they're extremely uh, dramatic. Uh, they are sort of idealized versions. Uh, uh, apparently, I have never uh, myself watched a dissection, but apparently you do not see things quite as clearly delineated. So trying to convey something that uh, uh, corresponds to uh, empirical first-hand observation, but also rendering it intelligible for the viewer and uh, drawing on the highest artistic uh, conventions from the time. So much so that for certain images, um, the most famous uh, sculptures in Europe at the time, antique sculptures, classical sculptures were used. And then it's as if you could look in and see something uh, invisible inside the sculpture, which are the interior organs of the human body. This um, question of seeing the invisible got even more and more important for science in the 1600s as scientists use new instruments like the telescope and the microscope to see things that were truly invisible to the naked eye. And so I am showing you the first engraving of a lunar observation uh, by Galileo uh, a name that is familiar to many of us. And uh, this is a very small, a small booklet. The previous books were massive, expensive. This was a quick and cheap uh, uh, publication, uh, something uh, that Galileo tried to get out very, very quickly. And it is based on the wash drawings that he made uh, when he looked through a telescope that he had built. So as you can see, uh, to be an artist meant to be looking, and it also meant uh, to be trained uh, in representing as much as possible. So these wash drawings were then uh, turned by a professional copper plate engraver into these illustrations showing the moon. And the uh, book that uh, there's a image, a photograph of the actual telescope. It's still preserved in Florence and uh, of the cover of the book. And as you can see, uh, there is a very prominent name towards the bottom of the title, uh, Medicea Sidera, the Medici stars. So this was uh, a book in which Galileo not only conveyed his observations of the moon, but also the first observations, the discovery really, of the moons of Jupiter. And like any enterprising scientist, uh, naturalist uh, in this period, he dedicated this discovery to an important patron who could fund his research, in this case, the Medici family. And so um, the observations, these are his notes, and he is looking through the telescope and trying to understand what he is seeing because he is looking at Jupiter and he sees some stars one night and then he goes back the next night and the stars have changed position, which is not supposed to happen. And then he keeps going back and the stars keep changing position. And then he realizes these are not stars, these are moons that are orbiting around the planet. And that's why sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't. And the book does a beautiful job of recreating this experience of visual discovery for the reader. And as you can see, it is done not through fancy copper plate engravings, but through very simple typography using asterisks to represent the stars and their movement so that you are reading the observations one by one and watching the movement yourself until you realize with Galileo what it is that you are seeing. Another uh, book uh, from uh, the 1600s, uh, this is a micrographia, the drawing of the very, very small uh, by another major scientist of the 1600s, Robert Hooke, uh, published only five years after the Royal Society of London was founded. 
And in this book, it starts with a plate of the instrument uh, that Hook used. He had not discovered microscopes. They were well known, uh, but he had been able to use uh, a very refined microscope to conduct very precise observations. And the real uh, change is that he published them in this beautiful, uh, uh, very detailed copper plate engravings. And so something that would normally be very tiny and uh, very invisible to the eye, like the eyes of a fly become this magnificent, uh, almost like stained glass in a cathedral, right? This is uh, uh, really uh, a hook uh, marveling at the works of nature. And this is, uh, I think, a very, very funny uh, engraving. You see the book uh, on the left and you see the fold out uh, larger plate uh, of a flea. So turning something very small and insignificant into something gigantic in uh, incredible detail. So um, these are some of the highlights of scientific illustration in the 1500s and the 1600s. But so far, the story that I have been telling you, which is the story that I learned as a student in the history of science, uh, is one where every single observation, every single scientist, every single artist was a man. And that is uh, not the case. Uh, so in the little time that I have left, I want to show you just two examples. And one of them was uh, one of the images by this artist was shown by Jen in the first presentation, Maria Sibylla Marian, a uh, Dutch uh, uh, artist and naturalist, a woman with an amazing, amazing life, uh, a trained artist, uh, a businesswoman. Uh, she started by doing something that was considered very appropriate for women, which is uh, painting flowers and then publishing books of flowers for women to use as models for embroidery. So by cultivating these so-called feminine arts of embroidery, of uh, watercolor, of still lives, many women were trained as observers and as artists and did important uh, scientific illustrations. Uh, one of the things that is remarkable about Marian is that she was also a scientific voyager. She went uh, from uh, um, Europe with one of her daughters to Suriname in South America, which was at the time colonized by the Dutch and conducted first-hand observations of the uh, insects and flora uh, of Suriname. And she was interested in metamorphosis, in the transformations of insects, which was a cutting edge scientific question at the time and something that seemed to really uh, uh, bring in both science and art, nature and art, the art of transformation. So her um, engravings are often called the first ecological images because they uh, are bringing together uh, botanicals, flora of Suriname, with the insects uh, uh, that live in those uh, environments. And as you can see, I hope, uh, with the life cycles of the insects. And some of the images are showing uh, a, not a rosy image of life, uh, 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 of the natural world. This is bringing us back to the dinosaurs uh, because you can see here these uh, spiders uh, that are um, uh, attacking and uh, feasting on a hummingbird. So uh, 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 very beautiful images, but also uh, very interested in the cycles of life and death. And um, if Marian was able to conduct these observations in Suriname, it was in part because of the indigenous and enslaved African servants uh, she had there who uh, took her into uh, uh, nature to see 
these specimens and who collected specimens for her and brought them back. She writes about them in this book. And indeed, uh, indigenous peoples around the world have participated actively uh, in the investigation and representation of the natural world. Uh, we could talk uh, uh, for a long, long time uh, about many examples, but because of time, I will give you just one. And I'm going to go all the way back to when we started. We had started in the 1540s, and this is a little book, not a gigantic brick of a book like Fuchs. It is actually called a little book, Libellus, uh, the little book of the medicinal herbs of the Indians. And it was created in Mexico uh, in 1552 by two indigenous uh, men who are named in the book. Uh, one of them was a um, Nahua uh, physician who was an expert in healing. And the other one was an indigenous a uh, writer who had studied in the Franciscan school of Tlatelolco and who composed uh, this book, as you can see, in a very, very elegant, uh, uh, very learned uh, handwriting in Latin. And then there are the unnamed uh, scientific illustrators uh, who drew all of the plants and products that are described in this book. Uh, and as you can see, the tradition, the artistic tradition that they are using is one that is not the same as a European uh, tradition, uh, but it is one in which the image is a central component of communicating knowledge of Mexican plants and of Nahua medicine and healing. So I am all out of time, uh, but I wanted to say uh, that if you are interested in learning more about this, I actually teach a whole week long class on the history of scientific illustration from 1500 to 1800 through a wonderful uh, nonprofit called uh, the California Rare Book School. And we normally do it live in LA, but this year we're doing it online in August. So uh, maybe I will see some of you there and uh, thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Hi, Daniela. Hi. That was so fascinating. I, I love Marion's uh, drawings. They're beautiful. Yeah. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, so my first one is you mentioned the luminators and how they would use um, potentially different colors. Do Did they have a general idea of what color to use for these drawings or was it really up to their own imagination? Yeah, that's a really good question. It really depends on what image we're looking at. Uh, we're talking about. So when we're mm -hmm. talking about drawings, right, about paintings, whether it's watercolor uh, uh, or wash, uh, the artist would be working directly in color and using uh, uh, the plant and paying very close attention to that. They actually had incredibly um, elaborate systems uh, for color coding. So before there was Pantone and a system for standardizing mm -hmm. colors, artists in this period were figuring out their own systems for saying not just yellow, but this very particular right. kind of yellow. But with printing, it was sort of a free for all. Uh, most books were not hand illuminated uh, unless they were luxury copies like Marian's work where she herself took care, she only sold uh, uh, the, all the illuminated copies, she made sure to do that. Oh, so she created sort of different tiers of product. She sold the black and white or the ones that she and her daughters mm -hmm. colored. But for the most part, it was extremely uneven. Um, kind of along those lines, um, how many copies uh, were there of these early books? Like how many were printed? What was the market? You kind of mentioned, and like who bought it or who could mm -hmm. afford to buy it? Yeah, so um, I love uh, 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 the history of the early modern book, and it was um, such a manual, right, handmade objects, mass produced, but handmade. Uh, for mm -hmm. some of them, we have that kind of information. There's some presses that were uh, very good at record keeping, and we still have their records. For some of them, we don't really know. 
Um, we do know that books like Fox's uh, Herbal or Vesalius were insanely expensive to produce, mm -hmm. extremely uh, uh, expensive, so that many printers would not recoup their investment uh, from making this. Um, mm -hmm. The number of copies that we have depends on what lasted in uh, rare books collections and libraries, but they were vital scientific objects. And so they have been collected since that period. And I'll also say that um, while some of these books were very luxurious, Vesalius, for example, who was a university teacher, he taught at a med school, he thought, mm -hmm. my students can't afford that. So he made these different publications for students that were mm -hmm. these uh, single sheet diagrams that he told them, cut up and paste in your notebooks. And we have some mm -hmm. student notebooks and they were making diagrams and they were drawing and they were using these cheaper versions of the print. So sort of like students doing what they need to do to be able to do their work more economically. Interesting. What made it so expensive to print? Like in comparison to, like Marion was making her own, were they, were they just as expensive or what was the difference? Yeah, so I mean, Marianne was an amazing businesswoman and she was really selling a very, very high-end luxury product for uh, uh, wealthy collectors, naturalists. I mean, she made four tiers of her publication and of the most expensive one, she made two copies and they are, uh, do you know who owns one of those copies? The Queen of England. Oh. Elizabeth, yeah. It's, it's in her <laughs> library. <laughs> well, she wasn't alive back then, but it's been in the royal collection since the 18th century. So they were just um, it, it's extremely expensive to produce. I mean, Audubon uh, famously went broke trying to publish his Birds of America, and it was terrible business for him. So, yeah. Um, okay, we have a bunch of other questions. Uh, this one's interesting. Uh, when I learned about Renaissance thought, it was so interesting that art, science, and philosophy were all connected. Why do you think these topics are now considered separate? I blame the 19th century. <laughs> Yes, they were, all of these things were considered very, very, very closely uh, uh, knit together. And, uh, and, and the disciplines as we know them today, scientific and otherwise, were invented in the 19th century. Uh, and that's uh, when these things start getting carved out. And part of it is specialization. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that we, uh, um, that there's some uh, greater awareness of the connections uh, between the arts and the sciences that is sort of coming back in some way. But everything changed uh, with the um, sort of changes in education and the university system in the 19th century. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Why is African illustration excluded so frequently in discussions of history of science illustration? Egyptians kept careful records and made excellent illustrations in books. Yeah, no, there, I mean, why is anyone other than, you know, this much of the world uh, excluded? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very, very uh, important uh, question. Uh, to Put it bluntly, um, the history of science, like the history of art as uh, um, sort of subjects of scholarly study were invented uh, 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 as we know them in Europe in the 19th century. And they had to do with looking internally and uh, um, sort of very, very, very narrow. And so that tradition lasted for a very long time. And I think it is only recently that it's become just completely obvious that it's a very partial and biased, uh, uh, sort of a very highly selective version of history. So yeah. uh, there's incredibly exciting work that is being done today by both historians of science and our historians looking at so much work that there is out there to do um, and last question, what is your favorite historical scientific artist and why? 
Oh no, I'm terrible at favorites. I like so many. One um, of your favorites. Oh man. Well, I'll say this. Um, I the, What has been most meaningful to me in my career as a scholar of these subjects is to discover for myself to find the work of people who have been written out of the histories of science and the histories of art and uh, um, like the amazing, amazing artists from Latin America that I have spent so much of my career uh, working on, whether we're talking about indigenous painters in 16th century Mexico or mestizo and uh, Creole artists in 18th century Colombia, uh, who did things that don't look the same as Europe, sort of match European scientific illustration. And for a long time, uh, that was sort of a reason not to study them because it was like, oh, it's not good enough. And when you just look at it from a different angle, it's amazing, it's mind blowing. So my uh, absolute joy has been to find uh, uh, works that were not in my textbooks, that were not in my classes and to, uh, and to write about that. Well, thank you so much, Daniela. This was a lot of fun. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, I think Christina added um, the link to Daniela's course um, in the chat. So check it out if you're interested. Thanks again, Daniela. Thank um, you. Up, this is great. Yeah. Um, up next, we have Masaki Uchida. Hello. Uh Hi, konnichiwa from Kyoto, Japan. Thank you for uh, sticking around so far. And thank you, Cal Academy, Lynn and Christina for finding me across the Pacific Ocean. Um, my name is, is, is Misaki Ochida. Um, I am a science illustrator. The, this picture was taken at here, my own studio, studio or a humble room in my apartment where I spend most of the time it's just especially since last year, as you know. As you see, I am using a tablet uh, here uh, for drawing, but uh, also you can see colored pencils behind and also watercolored. So I uh, use both traditional and digital media and usually combine everything at the end. That time I was uh, drawing a bunch of fishes uh, for the cover of uh, journal of Ichiological Society of Japan. So um, anyway, let me briefly talk about my background. So um, I call myself a science illustrator right now, but 10 years ago, I didn't know such career exists. And I was trying to become a sort of interdisciplinary researcher. First, I majored in physics in uh, Hiroshima University in Japan and then got a PhD after that. Then I um, came into the United States to study anthropology at the University of Washington. Then I uh, had an encounter to know science illustration at there and got fasc fascinated easily. Then um, luckily there was a certificate program at there. So I took that program and right after the graduation, I am fortunate. I was fortunate to uh, get a uh, do a position at the science illustration intern at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Then also worked at the Smithsonian National National Museum of Natural History. So I drew uh, lots of birds, bugs, fishes, and also some paleo arts. Then I came back to Japan somehow, working at Stem Cell Research Center. Um, the name of stem cell is called iPS cells. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically an artificial stem cell made from skin cells or blood cells and not from embryo. iPS cells were first reported in 2006 by Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, who is the director of our institute. And he got a Nobel Prize in 2012. Um, and I work here too. Uh, help researchers convey their scientific outcome and uh, communicate with people to share the findings using science illustrations. Um, Jane Christensen already talked about the role of science illustrations. 
which was which was beautifully summarized. And today I I would like to share my work at here to add more evidences to show that science illustrations are in demand. Also at the end, um, since I went back and forth from Japan to the United States, I found a sort of uniqueness of illustration taste or favor in Japan. And I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, so as you see right now, I have been uh, creating those kind of uh, illustration. Those are called infographics. The point of infographics is to illustrate the essence of articles main thrust or concepts. But I also have a chance to create different type of illustrations like this one. And this one looks different than the previous one. It's used for a cover uh, for the journal Cell issued in 2019. Um, at the first glance, it doesn't look like scientific at all, but there are hidden scientific concepts behind. If you see closely, uh, you will see a big dog and a small dog wearing uh, unfitted knit hats. And those unfitted knit hats transform into uh, wearable scarves for many kinds of diversified dogs. My favorite is German Shepherd, anyway, by the way. Um, here, the knitting is a metaphor for gene editing. Maybe some of you know, some of you know gene edit editing technique called CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which was recognized by the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. I think one of the two doctors awarded is Dr. Daudona, and I think she is in Bay Area in, in the United States. So the narrative is um, gene editing strategy could bring stem cell therapies to a wider range of patients. So this kind of illustration is called thematic illustration. And it's so different uh, from the infographics. And I can say that um, science illustrations can be uh, categorized into those two types. And I refer uh, those terms by um, to uh, Jane Christensen definition. The one is thematic illustrations that you have just seen. It's inspired by the text and which entice readers to engage more fully with the magazine's contents, like a uh, cover art or um, key visuals for posters, brochures, or any web content or anything. And it's more artistic. On the other hand, um, there's another type, it's, which is information graphics or infographics, which is built on the foundation of research that exists primarily to convey information. It could be uh, detailed, it could be simple, it could be superposed or cross-sectional or showing the procedure, depending on what scientific essence that illustrations want to emphasize. And um, so then let's compare those two types more. Voila. The type of this illustration is thematic illustration. I created this for the cover of the journal Cell issued in 2018. You see a blue uh, avatar looking woman blowing flower petals in the air with some kind of a swirling background referring to portraits of Vincent van Gogh. And uh, of course, there are metaphors. The uh, petals are uh, platelets. The, the platelets, platelets are um, one of the blood cells that have a function to stop bleeding when you get injured. And woman is a metaphor for a progenitor cell that produces platelets. So this kind of uh, platelets production is happening in your body every time, but it had been a mystery how this progenitor cell produced platelets. Then finally, uh, the new story published in this issue reported that it is a physical movement in the blood flow. More specifically, it's a physical turbulence that make a progenitor cells to uh, produce platelets. 
And that is why I painted, I painted a Goho-like um, background because it's turbulence, it's surreal sur everywhere, right? Um, so the narrative is uh, turbulence stimulates progenitor cells to produce tons of platelets. And here is the infographics of the exactly same science topics that I've just shown. It's so different, but same, uh, telling the same same science. So uh, again, the research group found it's it is turbulence that uh, stimulate a progenitor cells. The name of that cell is called megakaryocyte. Then platelets is generated from that. Um, then they invented new bioreactor. It, it's it's like a French coffee press machine, and they use. Are, they use that and artificially generate turbulence using that device. Then they succeeded in producing tons of platelets. Then uh, actually the clinical trial has just started recently and it's so awesome. Okay, another example here is a uh, thematic illustrations. Okay, please guess uh, which part of body this illustration, illustration is about. So please put into the chat form. I'm gonna see that. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. The Neuron is the name of the journal. Um, it's published in the in 2020, last year. So it's not in the brain, um, but maybe eventually connected to the brain. Um, you see a girl holding a large balloon and there are uh, bundle of, there are a bunch of ribbons tangling in it. Let's see, okay. Oh, muscle, lungs, brain, yeah. okay. Um, the answer is tan. So um, there are sensory organs called uh, taste buds in your tongue. The shape of that um, organs actually look like this balloon. It looks like a flower buds and um, then taste buds experience taste, which is uh, shown in different color here. Uh, sweet, salty, uh, sour, bitter, and umami. It's funny, funny because um, umami is Japanese. And um, and this uh, new findings uh, reported uh, identification of taste cell that are dedicated into sodium selective, which is salty. So the, so then the metaphor is balloons equals to sensory organs, taste buds, and ribbon is nerve, and narrative is uh, identification of taste cells and taste buds dedicated into the sodium selective. And since it's about the salty taste, I actually use salt in the background. You're, you see the grain, white grain background. I collage them and uh, combine them with my illustration. It's, it was so fun process. So this is the thematic illustration and this is a uh, infographics version of the exactly same science topic. This is, again, it looks different, but telling the same story. So uh, here is the taste buds, the research group identify the sodium selective uh, taste cell, which is shown in the red cells, and uh, elucidated the mechanism of that sensory going to the nerves. Um, yeah, this is infographics. So um, that was a comparison. And uh, the style is so different, as you see. Um, the reason why uh, style is different is because audience is different. Uh, regarding thematic illustrations, audience is uh, should be wide range of people. Um, so I tend to uh, create thematic illustrations using intuitive approach to make people uh, quickly grasp, grasp their uh, attention, like make it them more uh, pretty, Beautiful, cool, cute, uh, comfortable. It should be very quick. Um, on the other hand, for regarding information graphics, 
audience should be researchers, people who are interested in the subject. So we can expect people um, to pay uh, more attention, to use a moment to look at the in, uh, look at the illustrations. So um, I tend to create those by analytical approach, like make it more technical, rational, reasonable uh, way to uh, put the illustrations. So um, that's now. I think um, I've been creating those two types in our institute for about five years. And I feel that demands for those two are growing, I think because of this um, information age. So when people have to choose what to pay attention from a dozen of information coming out every second, it is quite natural that people tend to be more attracted by the contents which have a visual components. So um, understanding such needs some journals require submitting one piece of illustrations called graphical abstract or table of contents. It's uh, basically uh, tell a story at a glance. And uh, those infographics are used for thumbnails at, of their website. I just screenshot their uh, top journals websites like Nature and Self and here the uh, graphical abstract is used as a thumbnail. Um, also, those will be used for their um, social media, first page of the submitted art article, uh, news, and so on. And I have been um, requested to create these kind of um, graphical abstract uh, a lot recently. And those are some examples. I have already shown one of them. And some of them are Cove research, which are still in review. I'm not going to explain each, but those are graphical abstract. And um, creating this kind of infographics is not a simple task. Um, and I think um, it's universal of science illustrations, but research and communications are required to create uh, decent science illustrations. As for me, I always first read through whole manuscript of the paper, then um, communicate with researchers, authors of the paper to make it clear what is the point of the research, uh, what is the new findings of the papers, uh, how that results impact the, to the society, and so on. Um, so I think um, advantage of working as an in-house science il illustrator is I can do these things easily. You know, uh, getting access to unpublished confidential data and um, talking with experts about it is, would, would be harder if you were a freelancer outside of the institute. But so, and after research and communications, then I create a graphical abstract. And of course, there are many iterations happen until finalization. So uh, many modifications are needed until researchers finally uh, confirm that infographics accurately convey scientific information. And um, so that's the infographics. On the other hand, creating thematic illustrations, I found this has more freedom. So again, um, the good thing to work at in-house illustrator is that I usually create thematic illustrations after creating infographics. So I have already have knowledge about the topics. So I put into the brain with the spice of inspiration, association with something, then trying to pop out as an output of a form of art. It's uh, struggling, but it's also very fun process. I really enjoy that. Um, sometimes it fails, sometimes it works, but it's so delightful. And usually researchers uh, say 
that um, this is not my things. Uh, leave it. I, I will leave it to you. Create whatever you want. And I was like, all right, and create my art here. It's fun. Um, yeah. And lastly, I want to point out uh, one of Japanese uniqueness here. Um, so uh, as you see, as you see in the, my previous slide, uh, cartoonish manga style are highly common here. And I have been requested to draw such things a lot, like those above six guys. Actually, this is a character of our director, Shinya Yamanaka. So um, I had a reverse culture shock when I came back to Japan. So you know, um, when I was working at the United States, I had been drawing detailed, uh, realistic illustrations at there, then came back to Japan. Then first thing I was asked is, please draw a cartoonish looking guy, which is a director. And I was like, okay. So, but I enjoyed it uh, because it's kawaii. So here I made up the term kawaii effect. So kawaii is a Japanese referring to the um, cute, adorable, or mix of that words. And I found that people here are so attached to kawaii things. So like right now shown in the uh, photograph, I intentionally try to insert kawaii things besides scientific article. Um, because in general, people are a little bit hesitate to read those scientific article because it's complexing. But if there are kawaii things besides it, people may stop their eye on the pages. People may pay more attention than on kawaii pages. So that's the trick. So I call it kawaii effect. And here, I think there's a huge potential uh, as a for as a new style of science illustrations as a strategy to outreach people. You know, if people like kawaii things, why not be putting the kawaii, kawaii things to the article or scientific things to pull more attention? That's that would work. Why not? And at the end, um, <laughs> I want to uh, end up with a kawaii things. And this is one is also showing another uniqueness of Japanese, which, um, which is personification or anthropomorphism. Is that the right word? So those girls are personification of platelets. I hope you remember what platelets are. Um, these characters were from animation called Sales at Work TV series, which were recently on air. And there are many uh, personified sales in the show. And since it's animation, there are many stories out there. And each cell shows their function in the body. And it's so, uh, I blew, it blew it by mind. It's so well done. And I think, um, I guess this animation heightened the science literacy of kids or even adults and could be a good way to outreach people, right? Um, so why not kawaii things? <laughs> and that's the end. So thank you for watching and I'll be happy to receive questions and I will, and I will try my best to answer. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Misaki. That was such a wonderful breakdown um, of your process. And I love that. I, I think a lot of people love your, um, the term kawaii effect that you introduced tonight. So thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions, so um, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, uh, okay, so um, you do lots of different types of illustrations. Um, Tracy asks, it seems like an infographic, um, an infographic might take longer to create because it's so technical. 
but do thematic illustrations sometimes take longer because um, you have to come up with metaphors and they're more artistic. So which which one usually takes, which one is harder for you, I guess, or takes longer? As for me, it's about same. <laughs> and I use uh, mostly digital for uh, infographics and I combine traditional media for uh, thematic illustration. So that also takes time. So eventually it will be same time. Yeah. 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 Um, do you ever get um, kind of like writer's block, but for your illustrations, when you have to do a cover and you're just like, I can't think of a good idea. Does that happen to you? Uh, like, like you just get kind of stuck. You can't think of any good ideas. How often yeah, does that happen? That, that happened. <laughs> and <laughs> in that case, um, yeah, I just say sorry, but because it, it didn't come up come up to me and that could happen. But infographics, I, I somehow create some something for infographics. So mm -hmm. there are no no answer for infographics, but regarding thematic illustrations, there sometimes I fail. In that case I cannot submit any illustrations. And that happens. Yeah. Um uh, so when you were in um, the United States, you were doing more work in biological sciences, right? Doing really detailed. So um, what was it like jumping from doing work like in ornithology and entomology to doing like stem cell medical science? And how did you, um, how did you, how did you make that jump? <laughs> um, yeah, actually I was looking the position in a museum in Japan, <laughs> uh -huh. but I couldn't find it. But I found a <laughs> science communicator position in stem cell research center. So, and then I connect my illustration skills to that. So first I didn't expect that I could use my background here, but mm -hmm. um, then I knew that there is thematic il illustrations. Then I, I realized that I can use my knowledge of biology here, drawing birds or any animals here to express stem cell research. And that's what I'm doing right now. And it's so, so um, fun to connect my sporadic carrier paths and make it all combine, make it systemic, systematics and so fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, oh. What's your favorite? What's your favorite subject to draw? Is it cells, or a specific animal, or dogs and scarves? I love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I I love more tangible things, tangible animals to draw. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. So I I like that one more actually more than drawing cells, <laughs> but connecting those things are also fun too. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put a link to your website in the comments after this, because you have some really beautiful pictures of um, the work that you did at the, was it the um, Muse Museum of Natural History that you did work for? Oh yeah, I in the many, States. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and then, let's see. So, um, if you, so if you're creating graphics for media like magazines and um, and stuff like that, how is that different than producing work for scientific publications? How do you approach those differently? Um, so, actually, the science journal approach us to mm -hmm. suggest cover art art so uh, we didn't um yeah so what is the difference between science journal and magazine? yeah so science journals and like magazines that um 
wider audience might read? Yeah, so um, for the magazines, for a wider audience, the, so I think cover art should be um, more abstract, more prettier, artistic to catch quickly their attentions, mm -hmm. while scientific journal could be more specific, more technical looking detail or so, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, so it sounds like, somebody says, it sounds like you're always busy, but do you do any art for fun? Yeah. Do you do uh, art for fun? Except for illustration? Oh no! Just like, do you do any personal oh, yeah. art? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, I I do a lot. <laughs> yeah, I I draw many dogs, just for fun, <laughs> and cats. Mostly German yeah. shepherds. Oh yeah, yeah. German shepherds. I love, I love, I love them. <laughs> um. Oh, and um, do you have a pet dog? Somebody just asked if you have a dog. I have in my parents um okay house, but not here i okay. i miss i miss so much <laughs> yeah um and then uh have are you interested in or have you ever illustrated children's books um i haven't but when i was doing intern at cornell lab of ornithology there was a chance to uh, make a poster for children and I think that was closest project and that time I drew very cute cartoonish mm -hmm. characters yeah it was fun yeah mm -hmm. um well thank you so much for for being with us tonight and sharing thank your process it was, yeah it was very fascinating so um thank you and I'm gonna bring Lynn back to the screen Thank Hi. you. Hi. Hey, Lynn. Hi. I want more kawaii things everywhere. Um, but just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And a special thank you to Jen, Zoe, Daniela, and Masaki for presenting. Um, next week, celebrate Earth Day with us. We've invited some amazing people and organizations that are radically changing both the health of the environment and their communities. So come learn about their projects and hear about um, how these green prints, um, how these could be green prints, how their projects can be green prints for um, some larger efforts. Um, and also there's something special next week. So after night school, um, the Academy is doing its um, annual gala online, of course, but there's gonna be an after party. So at um, 8 p.m., we'll finish a bit earlier next week. Um, at 8 p.m., you can go directly to the after party, um, which features a DJ set by Chromio, um, plus a visit with our the Academy's African Penguin Quality Colony, a tour of the universe. I think there's some cool sand art, live sand art happening. Um, so I'm going to drop the link in the comments and you can register for free. So again, this after party happens after night school next week. Um, but yeah, thanks again so much for being here. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and take care of yourself. And um, we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Good night. Bye.